hello and welcome to this, e this evening's BCO Next Gen event, Future Proofing Officers for Life Science Adaptation. This is the first hybrid event we've held and the first in-person event that we've had in over 18 months. So it's really good to see all of you in person. It's great to have people join online as well. I'd like to start quickly by thanking HTS, who are our host and sponsor for this evening. Um, we're in their fantastic new space and it's great that you could provide us with the opportunity to do this. The life science sector in recent years has been growing at quite a pace um, and that's coupled with a reduced or, or supply that is under pressure. And this coupled with the similarities between office design and, and lab design, what we're seeing is an increase in office design sort of enabling itself for the ability to service both sectors. So with that in mind, our agenda for this evening, I'm gonna introduce you to our fantastic panel. And we're gonna do an introduction to life sciences. So the facts and the figures, followed by key discussion points. So some key design criteria, trends and as well as kind of a response to ESG and then we're going to follow up with some questions. So if I introduce our panel, um, we've got Anne Dalzell, oh we're going Steve first apparently, um, <laughs> you smiled, um, Anne has been working at Arup in the building services team for over 30 years, she has broad sector experience, arts, culture, higher education, commercial labs, you name it. She has a particular passion in um, low energy, zero carbon design and, and how one might use existing buildings and, and optimize them with the challenges that come with that, um, but the rewards as well. Next, we have Giorgio Cardone, who's from HTS, who started his structural engineering career in Italy and joined HTS in 2012. Similarly, has very broad experience across all sectors and has most recently been working on converting a factory to a life, multi tenant life science building with Cadans, which leads me on to Katie, who is from Cadans. She's a commercial asset manager in charge of leasing and transaction for the UK and Ireland portfolio. She's responsible for acquisitions as well as managing the whole tenant ecosystem. For people's benefit, Cadans is a specialist developer investor in laboratories and high specification asset classes. And last but not least, we have Steve Lang, who joined Savills in 2002 in the commer uh, commercial research department. He has over 20 years experience in life science and technology research um, and provides advice to owners, occupiers, investors, developers, and the like, as well as providing Savills internally with all the information that they need on a global scale with regards to life sciences. So that's our panel. Um, now, we'll, oh, and me, I'm Ange <laughs> Joseph, sorry, I should tell you who I am. I'm Ange Joseph, I'm a partner at Alinea. So I am a cost consultant. I won't be boring you with the numbers tonight. Don't ask me questions. Um, but I am also a member of the BCO Next Gen Committee and your chair for this evening. So an introduction to life sciences. Um, Steve and Katie are gonna talk you through the investment, what we mean by life sciences and just give us an overarching introduction. So I shall hand over to you two. And thank you very much. I was just saying this looks like the most rubbish band for <laughs> 2021. Here we go. We have a little song now on life sciences. Um, yeah, so hello, uh, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Steve Lang. Um, and you invite an analyst to these things, you're always gonna get the big numbers or some numbers as my colleagues sat here will, will vouch for. So interesting stats, you might think they're not interesting, but I do, but so here we go. Um, R&D spend, why does this matter? Companies spend a huge amount of money globally. If you look at the top two and a half thousand companies, how much do they spend per annum? It amounts to about 823 billion euros per annum. Big number. That's technology, that's automobiles, that's life sciences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you look at the share for pharma and biotech, it's about a 19% share. And you think, well, why do I care? Well, when you compare it to technology companies, Apple, Google, Facebook, you compare it to the automobile sector, they account for a 16% share. So this sector is spending a lot of money on R&D. R&D needs real estate. So there we go. That's why we're there, here this evening. If we just zoom into the UK and get an understanding in terms of what it means to the UK, uh, contributes 81 billion to our economy, over a quarter of a million jobs. I'm not going to go through all of these. I think in terms of the ecosystem, it's really important to understand why we're good at life sciences. We have three of the top 10 
Hi, Hannah. Um, we have three of the top 10 um, life science medicine universities in the world, um, in the UK, so it's fantastic. And it's also important to understand the role of the ecosystem, the triple helix, which is a, a slightly academic model, but it's where you've got to have the interaction of corporates meets government meets academia. You know, those three coming together is absolutely vital in terms of creating the right type of ecosystem to make life sciences work generally. And if we just flick to the next slide. Absolutely. Um, nice to see you all here this evening. Um, and thanks for kicking that off, Steve. Um, so I suppose, first of all, we need to say what is life science. Um, I think there's always, uh, I've found that there's been a bit of a confusion as to where life science actually sits as an asset. Um, is it alternative, which I think people tend to lean towards, sits with your student, um, your healthcare, et cetera but actually they tend to look like offices. So that gets a little bit confusing. Um, I think we associate them more with offices um, and that's when we come back to this wet lab versus dry lab and what does that actually mean? Um, but I think what's fantastic from my point of view and especially what we do as a business is actually life sciences is almost becoming a recognized, well, it is a recognized asset class in its own right now. Um, so that's fantastic. And, and that's driven by a lot of what we're gonna to touch on uh, in a moment. Um, but I suppose just to come back to the wet lab, dry lab, uh, perspective because I think this gets thrown around quite a lot um, and it's definitely a little bit more uh, detailed um, than, than just this very quick summary and we won't go into this but, but if you think about wet labs that's very much your your white coat typical hardcore science um, and then your dry lab um, which is your, your tech companies you know your Apple your Google etc if you go to their offices in, in Cambridge they they specialize in AI development um, and you think, well, that's just an office. Well, no, actually, because the level of equipment and things that have to go into these buildings, they need a little bit more than just a standard office. They can't just go into any office building. Um, so there's a lot of considerations and things that need to be taken in. And that's why, um, in terms of what we do, we, that's why we class them as high specification assets, just because they need a little bit more than, than a, a standard office perhaps needs, um, which again, these guys will, will touch on later. Yeah, so the fundamentals are compelling. Again, small text, but to read at your, your leisure at the weekends. Um, plug for our research, please do have a look at our research. But what's the big driving factors on a global stage as well as in, in the UK? Well, healthcare spending is going up, aging population, you know, big factors, big macro factors that affect the need for more R&D, more life science generally. Case already touched upon it, the technology meeting, life science, the Googles, the Apples, you know, wearing their wearables, their watches, they want to measure what we're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Apple's number one global priority is human health. No real surprise that it's going to, get, it's going to go in a big way. Um, but also it's around venture capital funding, how much money is going into this sector. And if we flick to the next chart, you can see that follow the money. You now, it's really important to understand global flows of capital and how this is increasing over time, because... The thesis being that as companies raise money, they have headcount growth, they need more real estate. And that's what we're seeing in all of the markets, whether it's London, New York, San Diego, et cetera, et cetera. We're tracking this across the globe. It's grown at 23% um, year on year over the last 10 years. There's a fly in my face. Um, and is it a COVID thing? You know, we've been asked this question, is it all about COVID? And as you can see on this chart, 2020, it grew considerably. But it's just been grown over time. And this year is likely to surpass what we saw in, in 2020. So money is flowing into the sector, into new companies. So future occupiers, you know, in five years time, probably don't even exist yet. And if we flick to the next slide, um, let's just take it back to the UK. So this is a good illustration. If you look at the flow of money, where money was raised, venture capital, life science for 2020 across the world, excluding the US, Here's the top 25 locations, towns and cities across the world. If we just flick one more, please. Uh, there's Oxford, Cambridge, London, and Stevenage. So four of the top 25 locations attracting life science venture capital in the world are in the UK. Uh, Stevenage is a bit of an odd one. We can come on to that. We have an expert on Stevenage in the audience here, Tom Mellows from Savills, uh, and he'd be delighted to talk to you all about Stevenage uh, over drinks. Head into the next slide. What's the other rationale? Why is the UK also good? 
Um, and this is sort of like good and bad stories. So we looked at life science salaries across the globe for the same type of companies, same type of roles. And as you can see, London, Cambridge, Oxford is towards the bottom. I think it's quite sad for scientists that they're not paid uh, more money. But broadly, as one, one investor, US investor said to us, effectively, you're getting a quality of science that is probably world class, if not you know, the best um, on a two for one deal in terms of scientists. So the UK is, this just sort of underlines the foundations and fundamentals of why UK is an exceptionally strong place to do life sciences overall. I hope to see that salary level rise, of course, over time. Great, thank you. Um, so just to put that into context in terms of where the life science real estate cycle, uh, because that's obviously why we're here to talk about real estate. Um, what I find really fascinating about this sector amongst any other is, as we've touched on, it's this investment. So it's the scale up and, and the, the, the speed of what these companies need to move at. Um, I can be Katie Nelson, who's just studied biological science at Cambridge, if only. Um, <laughs> uh, and I could come out of my degree and I could have an idea. I'll go to university and I'll say, I really want to specialize in this bit of research, like biomolecular molecular DNA whatever, these other words that get thrown around a lot uh, in what I do. And uh, they'll give me £10,000 to go and do some research. I'll do six months worth of research and I can make some really good findings. Might not have found the answer, but I've, it's looking promising. You can go out to venture capitalists and they might believe in my story and I can do a great sales pitch and they might give me £5 million. Um, and then overnight, I can go from a one-person business to a 50-person business. And again, I can do another six months worth of research um, and then get another 100 million, uh, depending on what I'm doing. So what that means is, if you go from a one-person business um, in the university's uh, incubator space over there at three o'clock, um, probably more two o'clock, um, and you then go overnight to having to hire all of these scientists and be 50 people, you can't be in that one-person little room doing your science anymore. You need a grown-up facility. Um, so then that's when people start coming through these different areas and people sit in the accelerator and incubators, which are often supported by the universities or other institutions, where they get a lot of help and how they grow their business. But sometimes these, the speed is so exponential, they get shot out the other side and out into the real estate world. Well, fundamentally, the real estate world is, is not that fast paced. Um, you know, it's quite hard to sign a lease in 24 hours um, because our legal process is, is much harder. Um, so I just find it so fascinating how quickly these businesses have to scale up and the level of money that goes into it. Um, and, and they just don't care about the research. Um, not the research that's, that wasn't an insult to you, sorry. Uh, they don't care about the real estate. They just need a building that operates for them. And, and, and actually what we're finding is often uh, this, buildings are having to be retrofitted and actually it's becoming substandard uh, facilities. Um, I'll speed up now. Um, dots on maps. I love dots on maps. So if you look at 2020 life science deals, I guess the point from here is I, I want to say it's not just all about the, the Golden Triangle. It is important. The Golden Triangle is connection between Cambridge, Oxford and London. You can see a big density of dots and deals being done. So this is companies that are raising money in the UK last year that are life science related and headquartered here. But the key point is that we're seeing a northern arc emerging. The Scottish markets are also incredibly strong. So this is a fantastic sector for the levelling up agenda, which is another reason why the UK are really interested in this. Um, we're just going to see more and more demand throughout the rest of the UK. So we just flick on to the, the next slide, please. The Golden Triangle. So it is worth touching upon this, but not all of these points. Of course, again, you'll read this when you look at the slides at the weekend. Um, those ingredients, that triple helix, the need for having the right type of ingredients is absolutely fundamental around education, uh, corporate connectivity, uh, government support. But really the key point from, from this slide is, is probably bottom right hand corner where you look at Cambridge and Oxford in terms of commercially leasable lab stock, it's probably about 5 million square feet. You compare that to a relatively smaller area um, in population terms, et cetera, that you start thinking about Cambridge um, and Boston, Massachusetts, they've got about 30 million square feet. So you see this big, big disconnect in terms of the amount of space. Are we gonna be where Boston and Cambridge are? Probably, how long is that gonna take? Is it five, 10, 15 years? We don't know, but we're certainly heading off in that trajectory. Hence why I think there's a massive appetite for much more real estate around the life science sector. 
Right, thank you both very much. So now that we understand the context and, and where the money's coming from, I'm gonna hand over to the designers who are gonna talk more about um, so, sort of the key considerations when they're in the first instance designing a new build and how that might compare to considerations when they're designing an office. So I'm gonna let the structural engineer talk first on this occasion. So, Hi everyone. Yeah. I, I will talk a bit more over the technical aspects, although uh, I will not be talking too much about that in details. For us, it's all about the design requirements. And when we design, especially in the comparison between life science and offices, and uh, that one key aspect of the life design is that there are not design standards or uh, guidelines. There are uh, most of the time like, like the BCO standards for offices. So for life science, you don't have that privilege. There are some guidelines for healthcare buildings, but not specific for life science because of the variety of the applications that's not available. So most of the time, our approach is based on benchmark or uh, experience of the design team, or if you're lucky, client's input as per cadence. Uh, and the design requirements between life science and office may change massively. And uh, the implication on the structure is, is, could be significant and not just on the structure, but knock on effects on cost and sustainability. So what I've done, I've tried to show you a, a clear comparison between the uh, offices and life science. The two criteria that we, they are more important for us are loading and vibration. In terms of loading, typically we design offices with average blended loads of 3.75 based on the BCO standard. Life science, in our experience, most of the time required 40% of additional load in the floor area. And this is itself, as you can see, has got a big impact on the structure. I've, I've graphically tried to show what that means with our HDS elephants similarities. And you will see that the, the occupation of the floor itself is uh, much more onerous. But the other key, crit key criteria for us are the vibrations. The, the vibration is, uh, I mean, very briefly, is measured with response factor. The response factor is, is a ratio, is a number, and uh, basically, uh, is the way the structure responds to dynamic loads so people walking or equipment vibration for life science building you want very stiff floor floor that don't are not sensible to vibration because they may affect the functionality of the equipments mainly and lower is the number better is the reaction of the floor to vibration those two values, the values for offices is taken from BCO standards. Again, thanks God there is a BCO standard. For, for life science, those are the typical values. And when you start talking about 0.5 RF response factor, that's a very low value. And uh, I've shown here the implication of this one on the structure. And without going through the details numbers, the major implication is that you will have to design much, much heavier structures for life science, uh, increase structural zones, and uh, uh, with knock-on effects on foundations, on uh, facades, on service distribution. For a typical uh, floor like metal deck and uh, steel, you'll have an increased structural zone based on our uh, studies of 200, 230 millimeters. For concrete frame, which is the next slide, probably less is 50 millimeter increase. These are case studies based on our on, on a project for cadence. And, what this means, this means that most of the time our clients come to us and want to design buildings for flexibility. And the reason is that most of the time when you approach a life science building, you don't have tenants. So you want to be sure that the building is designed for the full flexibility, future proofing. And this is a typical request from our clients also for other type of mixed used buildings. But the implication of this one on the life science building is massive. So what, what, what can be done? The approach is either you know, design the building for the most onerous case, but then you compromise the layout because for some of these criteria, it's really difficult to justify the structure for more modern type of buildings like a, a long span and open spaces. So there is a compromise there, or as we do often challenge the blank load app application of the design and you know, make sure that somehow there is an intelligent approach to the design where you can still um, uh, assign specific area for, uh, for offices, which is the lowest uh, criteria, and maybe use the lowest floor or the, the, the basements for, uh, for laboratories where you inherently will achieve the design and the onerous criteria. So uh, my message here is that the project brief is key for 
our uh, for for the approach for the design and the project brief needs to be uh, prepared together with the design team sometimes because the clients we need to understand the implication of the life science design compared to offices. I've added another slide because this is, uh, I mean, Anis is going to talk about the services integration more, but uh, I just want to show the services integration is massively, this is really important. And, you know, there are ways to design flexibility by using maybe a flat soffit where you can have a good horizontal distribution. But one of the key issues sometimes is the below ground drainage, which is sometimes, uh, I would say, underestimated sometimes mainly by clients because they don't know the implication of that. And this is a key example of how the design can be affected from, this is the pre, same building, pre-contract uh, design based on employment requirements where the brief was really uh, basic and vague uh, because there were no tenants. And that one is uh, what is being built on site. And uh, uh, that is when the tenants came on board. And I just wanted to show this one because the implication with specifically the below ground drainage is massive. If we were lucky in this case because the tenants came on board before construction and we could redesign everything. But, you know, you can understand that if you, the substructure is already installed on site to retrofit that level of uh, uh, drainage could be a big issue and loads of aborting work. So define the project brief based on clear assumption. And there are ways to overcome this one. You could have installed a raised floor or as uh, Anne will say, she's gonna give you some more tips, but keep in mind these key issues, which are important for us. I've got no elephants in my presentation. I'm sorry about that. So from the MEP side, I totally agree with Giorgio. The problem is, or the challenge we have, you shouldn't use the word problem, should you? The challenge we have always is that we don't ever start with a clear brief. And as Giorgio said, we do need to work with our clients and with our um, whole design team to work out what it is we are attempting to build because at the moment we're all trying to be sustainable and we have to balance this idea of flexibility versus adaptability. We don't want to be throwing all the embodied carbon in the world into something that um, provides everything for everyone. Um, we do want to, exactly as Giorgio was saying, consider carefully what we are going to provide Yes, they may, it may come with limitations, but we need to be sure about what we're going to do and make a considered response to it. So the key things for an MEP engineer, and I was mad to see Giorgio showed some flat slabs in there in the end, um, <laughs> is the first one is what type of science are we doing? Or what type of science do we think we're going to provide for? And this goes back to what Katie was saying earlier about the wet lab and dry lab and, and the proportions of each and how clever we want to be about over providing or providing an adaptive solution that can kind of expand or grow to meet a growing need depending on those tenants come along. The second thing is about what extract provision. So the reason we're talking about extract provision is because obviously you'll remember from school and from any lab jobs that you've done, you quite often have fume cupboards, they have a very high airflow rate and some of them extract to the air and need to be beautifully and carefully dispersed and modeled to make sure that they're not going to kill anyone where they land, you know, in someone's bedroom window or something. But also they involve moving a lot of air. So in comparison to BCO office uh, brief, we're moving about three times as much air in the science floor than you would do on an office floor. And that's to do with cleanliness and to do with dilution and extract, etc. So how we provide the extract, whether it has to go to the chimneys and whether we have to find places for those or whether we're doing recirculating fume cupboards is one thing, but the amount is always a kind of consistent thing at the moment. I think things will change, but we'll come on to that later. So both of those things um, drive the floor to floor height, especially combined with Giorgio's fancy um, extra deep soffit, which is supposed to be uh, vibration proof or rather stiffer than, than usual. And they link again, as Giorgio was saying, to the, to the drainage provision. So there's, as Giorgio was sort of saying, two ways of doing this. One is about, you know, traveling on each floor. And that's quite difficult. Um, traditionally, science users don't like uh, raised floors. If you have a, a chemical spillage in a raised floor, you don't know where it's going to end up. 
So we tend to kind of try and, and do this kind of thing. Well, actually, you're going to tell me this is a raised floor. Someone's going to tell me that. But it's, it looks fairly solid to me, and it's fairly monolithic. This is the kind of thing that you would normally do in a science building, which means, of course, then, that you've either got to put lots of vertical droppers in, and those both get picked up in Giorgio's sub-slab uh, drainage, or you end up crossing at other floors. And again, depending on how your tenancy splits are, that might not be ideal either. So it's a very careful thing to consider. Um, the other things that we have to consider with new builds are servicing and logistics. And Katie's gonna talk a bit more about this in a minute, but some of that is about lift provision, how we actually move things around, where gases sit, where uh, I accidentally mentioned lit liquid nitrogen, I'm sorry. Um, chemicals, all of those things that need to be carefully um, stored uh, safely and moved around the building safely and often needs consideration about separating them from other uses you know making sure that there are routes that are separated apart from that um we've got as we talked earlier about the kind of consideration about adaptability how much do we want to include in our central plants are we going to go full hog with 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 life science are we going to over um perhaps over provide on ventilation everywhere, which means you've got bigger cooling and heating loads than you would otherwise need. Or are we gonna do, gonna guess back ourselves that we've got a good mix of science and wet lab, dry lab, office, that we can kind of predict roughly what we're gonna do. How are we gonna model it? Are we gonna allow a little bit of creep in there? You know, it's, it's an interesting question. There aren't any real answers. It's a balance that we have to take on each project. And the final thing, I suppose, well, I did mention the raised floors already. Oh, I've got that bit already done, haven't I? So I won't bother, bother with that one again. Um, you all right? Yeah. I think someone's just asked a question. What? A I think, question. Do you want to? No, we've just noted that everyone should post questions in the Q&A box if you're online. But we will come to questions at the end. I promise to leave time for that. So if we keep going, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Super quick, like, touch me um, very much into all of the points that have been said. But it's about um, the occupiers, ultimately. We need to let our buildings um, because that's what we're here for. Um, but it's about uh, the consideration. In an office, it's very much getting your staff through the building in a safe way um, and to their desks. See, when it comes down to science, there's so much more that needs to move around that building. Um, and a prime example of that is, is liquid nitrogen. Um, it's, it's very, um, I find it a very scary sub substance, what I've learned about it recently and what it can do. Um, but they have to be considered very carefully. Liquid nitrogen is a oxygen removing substance. Um, and it comes in gas tanks. And if you need to service labs on an upper floor, that needs to travel up through the building. If you put that into a, a lift, um, you can't get in with that because if it has the tiniest little leak, someone's dead within half a second. There's no messing around. It's very quite serious. Um, so there's a lot of serious considerations that need to go with, with operations and, and, as I said, moving around the building for those type of things and, and chemical stores and all the other lovely things that go way over my head. Okay, thank you. So now what I'd like each of you to answer is, we've talked about the new build, but obviously we've also spoken about how much existing building stock we need to potentially convert. So what are the differences if we were converting an existing building? And on this occasion, we'll let Anne talk before right. Giorgio so he doesn't steal all your thunder again. <laughs> so, so this is my same list. And these are the things that particularly apply to an existing building so we've already talked about the fact you know you've got an existing building we probably have an existing it's unlikely that we're going to be changing the floor to floor height I know it can happen sometimes but it's unlikely so we're assuming it doesn't what this brings is limitations so instead of having a blank slate where you can decide from scratch how to balance your provision there will be an upper edge to what you can do um, so in some cases, it may mean you cannot do wet labs on certain floor to floor heights, for example, your extract provision may not be achievable within a certain height, you may not be able to do it on a certain floor plate, or you may need to rearrange things, maybe you run things outside the building, maybe you put floor to floor on the floor plant externally, you know, maybe there are other clever ways of doing it, but that's a key uh, limitation to what you can do and, and and the floor to floor height is the kind of key thing I think 
um, that, that makes that, that drives that. Drainage provision, going back to Giorgio's point, is your sub-sub drainage is, is probably already in. So actually that might be a, another key limitation. And you're working with an existing building. So as Katie was saying, all of those things about safely moving things around, having the right number of lifts, having um, key access, for example, to lifts, those things need to be thought of carefully in an existing building. And your provision of central plant, of course, the, the space might be limited because even with an existing, for example, naturally ventilated building, you are likely to need to condition this for cleanliness reasons, if nothing else. So it is a different thing. Um, adaptable, not flexible, I think is the key here. As I, you know, it's, it's a sad thing to over provide. We don't want to be doing it. We've, we've, we've learned more, we've learned better. We should know better now. And, and so there are limitations to existing buildings, but, see I've changed it, but, <laughs> but there are opportunities and we should be looking at them. So I think it's, it's a challenging thing. It's exciting. We're in a new space at the moment. Let's, let's just give it a go. We, we'll do it. Talking about opportunities from ours, it's exactly what Andy says. For us, it's exactly the same. You're dealing with the cycle strain existing building, all the issues that we discussed before have uh, a disproportionate impact on the design or the retrofitting this building. But there's one consideration we want to do, and there are loads of buildings that inherently have the capacity to be adapted. And uh, either because from our side, they've been designed with all design codes, which have more onerous no requirements, or because have historically been designed for different use, like factories or workspace, and probably have changed over the time and they are used for uh, offices. But the only way to unlock these opportunities is to, uh, uh, to research the buildings. And most of the time we approach our clients and we, we recommend the clients to involve us in the pre-acquisition stage, because we do lots of due diligence uh, reports and uh, feasibility study where we can really identify with the client the real opportunity of a buildings to be adapted and the real risks. And the clients will have a better approach on the acquisition. So there are buildings that can be adapted. There are lots of limitations. We just need to be sure that the process is followed and the technical people are involved at early stage because it's the commercial decision most of the time are dictated by the capacity of the building to be adapted. Steve is stats man because you like your stats any feel for kind of amount of building stock that can be adapted or asset classes that are best in in, in terms of quantum I, I quote my colleague Tom Mellows here um, <laughs> that in central London I think Tom correct me if I'm wrong it's about 30 percent of probably built stock is probably adaptable to some shape or form that picks up on all the round lifts and slab to slab and see I've learned a lot over the last year um, using terminology like that so so yeah it's probably about 30 percent I'd say uh, and in terms of in terms of, sort of different sectors I think sort of it is quite exciting that I know we're talking about offices here but there is conversions of retail etc cetera, etc cetera, as well but I think in terms of converting space into labs that could be could have been retail could have been sheds or whatever it's great for us as a, as a BCO that effectively we're creating more office stock so that's great for our, our industry. You know, in old use classes, it was a B1B. Um, I know it's not now, but so it was a B1 use. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all very much. So what we would now like to pick your brains on is what do you see the trends across the sector? What does the future look like? So Steve, your Another chart. <laughs> Another chart. I hear you cry and laugh about. Uh, yeah, I think I just want to pick up on that, that technology sector so when you when you speak to people on the west coast they talk about life science and pharmaceutical it was always known as the other tech um, but we've seen over the last 18 months that that the core tech has kind of slightly moved out and the uh, the life science sector biotech sectors have moved in so that technology meeting life science is just going to be incredibly significant going forward and what have i shown here well i'm back to my funding i'm back to my venture capital over the last few years on a global stage and i just looked at from all the data that we've got we just looked at it by life sciences as a broad category but we can break that down into sub verticals sub sectors if you like so at the bottom you can see that 
about a third of life science is life science in terms of a more traditional where we're talking lab coat type uses but the manufacturing comes in here oncology is a particular sector but then we start getting into tech media telecoms health tech digital health growing incredibly strongly in in london and new york in terms of funding going into those sectors so this is where we're getting to that dry lab meets computational meets wet lab and life science sectors generally and the one percent in the cannabis area is something that we're looking into quite strongly in savills um, and we're doing some core research and we'll get back to you in the next next few years on that we won't be inviting you to speak at that point <laughs> no i won't know where i am <laughs> This is a kind of an MEP one again. Um, so what we're seeing, you know, very much as Steve was saying, is that experimental science is being increasingly supplemented by data-driven analysis. So what we've seen in the old days was, you know, yards and yards of meters and meters even of, um, of fume cupboards and white coats and, and people working away in experiments. But now we are finding that there is less use of um, wet lab and a, a, an experiment will be um, mined uh, for its data um, and therefore the kind of technological kind of computer aided experimental processes are much higher now than they used to be and this is the dry lab so essentially we're, we're you know or, or whatever you want to call it whether it's a data lab or whatever so more dry lab less wet lab and of the wet lab, we're finding that more recirculation fume cupboards are, are, are taking place now. I mean, I've been, I'm old. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew, for missing that out of my bio, by the way. Um, I did put that in. Um, but we're finding that, um, you know, even in the, in the time that I've been working, it used to, that people did not use recirculating fume cupboards, and now they do. And now they're becoming more and more popular. So there is a change in how people are viewing things. There's, um, you know, airflow rates have gone down. There's been a quite marked um, and, and recent big change, partly driven by sustainability and partly by just good tech and better ways of testing equipment. That means you can find more efficient and effective ways of doing things. So because of that, we're finding that there are less, uh, more, ex more recirculation fume cupboards means less extract to air. Um, but because of the need for cleanliness, there is still a kind of fairly high air change rate compared to offices. I suspect some of that might decline, but at the moment we're not seeing it yet. We'll just have to keep an eye on it. Increased data lab needs, and I think Katie, you covered this really well earlier. Data lab is not office. There are, in certain areas, you end up with particular needs for fantastic comms because the amount of data that they're moving is specifically high and needs to be connected to either experimental um, uh, you know, equipment or to, um, to the user. Um, and and it, it is big data. There is a massive amount of stuff being moved around. So there's quite often a higher comms uh, resilience need and that often drives a higher um, small power load and therefore cooling and all of the stuff that goes with that. So it's an interesting, um, different thing to a standard office and something that we need to take into account when we're calculating how we, how we, what we, what we consider as the provision for a building. And then Katie, I'll ask if there's anything else you want to add to what the two have said. <laughs> Perfect. Right, so the, the final kind of question that we have for the panellists for this evening, or from me, and then I'll open it up to the floor, is with the growing importance of the environmental, social and governance agenda and kind of the perception of the, the building and the operational um, impact of these buildings, how do you see the sector responding to those challenges and adapting to them? And so I will ask um, Anne first. first. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm getting... getting this is you done now <laughs> so uh, i think i've said it before but adaptability not flexibility so as as those of you that have been in the industry a while will know and certainly mechanical engineers um we have as mechanical engineers been um concentrated for a long time on operational carbon and finally finally we've got the hang of the fact that the structural engineers have been showing us up and have been concentrating on the um on the embodied carbon and we need to follow suit 
So that diagram on the, on the right shows the amount of carbon that goes into a building. And the light green is your embodied carbon. So the first big spike is when you build it. The smaller spikes are, you know, um, refurb is the middle one. And the final one, and there may be more than one refurb, it's just a diagram. Um, but the final one is the kind of takedown of the building. And of course, nowadays, what we're trying to do is reduce um, all of that embodied carbon as much as we can, and also the operational carbon, which is the dark green. So one of the things that we are seeing is that obviously um, the amount of kit us ridiculous mechanical engineers put into a building results in an embodied carbon amount and we need to reduce it. So we have to be clever. We don't just throw everything at it. We have to think carefully about what we're going to provide for and what we're going to include. And if things start to grow in an ideal world, we'll have a grow, a growable, that's a terrible word. Uh, you know what I mean? A, a, a way of increasing the uh, capacity of our system so that we can extend them or expand them or adapt them to allow for more provision if that's what comes along because as i think georgia was saying earlier quite often we don't have tenants at the beginning of a life science project or a lab enabled project so that's one thing the second thing is so that that brings that's actually two things look there we go we covered the adaptability not flexibility don't throw everything at it and the considered provision how much are we going to provide how do we adapt it or increase it if we need to and then the third the third thing is about the building longevity by including something, some kind of adaptability to what may have been a, a standard office building, we provide an extra potential usage for it, which hopefully will give it some extra longevity. We, the, the life of that building and therefore the usage of that big blob of embodied carbon used in the building of it um, will extend and that green the lower green line the, the kind of operation can go for miles and miles we could have refurb after refurb after refurb and that should be what we're aiming to do so anything we can do to increase the length of time that a building is useful is a good thing now obviously there are sums that we can do um, that, that make sure that we're putting the right cut we're spending our carbon wisely is one way of thinking about it um, but but that's one of the aims and one of the reasons this is a good thing carefully done that's it from me yeah for us as Anne was saying the, the big contribution if we want to say from the engineers to the sustainability is the initial part of the life cycle is the cross structure and it's all about a body carbon for us uh, and uh and, and no i'm for an engineer, and body carbon is affected by the volume and the type of materials we use to build the structure. It's pretty much like that. And what I've done here, I've just put a comparison. Again, this is a real study we've done for a building. And again, it's an estimated value pretty much uh, based on our own internal uh, uh, tool. And as you can see, for all the reasons we discussed before, the contribution to the body carbon for a life science building is much, much more onerous than an office building. And, and this goes back again to everything we said intelligent approach to the design and use the right materials for the right application, especially now that this is on top of the agenda of most of the clients. There are key design decisions to be made based on this sort of uh, uh, optioning, basically. Now, finally, Steve. Right, so, okay, I'm back to my triple helix. This is the triple helix, so back to my academic model here. You can see the overlap of industry, academia, and government all coming together. Now, we've talked about air changes and perhaps with an ESG agenda, you might think, well, it's not very good on the E. Um, but this is a 20-year-old model, and it was 10 years ago that if we flick to the next... Sorry, there's quite a few builds on this one. They put, a, they put the S around it quite early on in terms of... We talk a lot about the building, but the actual scheme for life science or life science as a place, the societal impact is very strong. Community driven is something that we're seeing a lot more within schemes and life science locations, not being in a field somewhere with lots of security around it. Now it's much more open. We're seeing that in lots of schemes across the world. Um, and then probably more recently, they have then had the environmental wrap around it. So I think they are doing a lot more in terms of making sure that these buildings that they create 
are much more sustainable. No real surprise, big pharma have pushed into this area considerably. So overall, ultimately, if you go to the final click, you've got to make sure your real estate sits right in the middle of that, that, that sort of diagram. And that's where that's what makes a good ecosystem. And this is why the triple helix is absolutely critical. And we're seeing this in lots of schemes across London, UK, and across the globe. So that just gives you sort of like a visual representation of where life science is meeting that. ESG and how it's meeting the ESG agenda. So it's gone from the triple helix to the, now the quintuple helix. Question marks, what's next? We don't know. Right, so thank you very much to all the panelists for answering our questions. I'd like to open up to the room and see, perfect, a question, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, it, it comes up sometimes. It's not part of our expertise, but um, yeah, I, I do agree with you. That's definitely not the recipe. We need to find a way to approach that. And as mentioned before, uh, you could either compromise on the structure or you need to find another solution. Uh, I uh, we, we never come across any like that one. We've never been uh, experienced, uh, uh, no, and, uh, uh, and clients and equipment that is, is, is able to deal with that in the way that the clients want. And uh, so I don't know if there is anything that you've been able to Yeah, we've done some. <laughs> so we've had, to, I've had a few and, and sometimes it's because um, it's a specific client that has a purpose-built building and then has decided to put something that they weren't expecting in. And they've ended up with either, you know, the kind of um, cut out some of the slab, put that kind of damping into the base of the, the desk and also include the kind of uh, non-vibrating desk, but otherwise op optical tables quite often um, added, certainly in university spaces where, um, where, you know, they've changed the usage or they've gone, you know, sensibly, I think, for a, a fairly... Um, lean uh, or considered approach, like, like we were saying, a kind of intelligent approach to how much they're going to provide in the slab for vibration control, knowing that there are ways to get out of jail, in other words, to, to kind of use those kind of op optical tables. But the other thing is about positioning of the equipment, you know, stiffer next to the col columns. Is there a way of, of using the natural stiffness of the structure to, um, to, to manage how you locate things does that help and of course there's the standard you know mris shove them in the basement thing yeah exactly you know <laughs> so there's a kind of like a, a suite of different kind of answers to all of these things but i think i think you're right i think we should be questioning and sometimes clients are used to being able to build their own spaces from scratch and therefore they expect everything but maybe we have to now be a bit more cute and clever about this stuff Right, I'm going to go to a question online. Um, so the question from Andy Pye is, given the current challenges in the retail sector with so many stranded department stores assets, what do the panel think the opportunities and challenges would be for putting life sciences on the high street? So I'm going to give this to Katie, I think. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you can defer it along if you'd like. <laughs> An interesting one. Uh, something that I looked at quite a lot in my previous 
role um, before joining Kadam's um, is, you know, the, the whole repurposing agenda, which is all very topical and has been for a while. Can we put it there? Yes, I think it comes back to the dynamics and the triple helix that um, Steve touched on earlier. It, you know, are the um, macro and micro elements in that location? That's fundamentally where you get a life science cluster come from. Um, and then obviously then you then get into the challenges of the building. Um, I always found that it was quite difficult to, um, from my expertise anyway, from my view that if you took a, a Debenhams or whatever on a high street um, and turning that into office, it was never actually a, a straight answer. So if we can't really turn it into offices, we can't really turn it into life sciences because as we've discussed, there's a lot more other um, considerations that need to take place, um, whether it's the operations, moving that liquid nitrogen around the building, uh, the health and safety requirements that come with it, you know, it's much more than just getting people into a building. Uh, there's big operational considerations. So I feel like that was... That's a very good answer, but I, I just wanted to add something. So I was in a discussion recently about oh, poor old Debenhams. It's always poor old Debenhams, isn't it? So again, about what, what are we going to do with all the empty Debenhams? And it was a conversation about education. <laughs> and I'm just thinking maybe we're not doing this right. Maybe we should be thinking about uh, a building, an ex Debenhams that's half ed education and half life science. You know, maybe we maybe we build our own clusters. So I don't know is the answer. I, I, th I think every, probably every Debenhams is different. Um, and so they would need to be looked at specifically, but I do agree that I think the, the um, community has to be there to support it. Okay, any more questions in the room? Yeah. Um, I've got a question on sort of wet lab provision um, and quantum of wet lab space. So um, I'm Brad Hudson, I work for M3 Consulting, um, and we're currently just approaching the end of Reba Stage 2 um, on a project in London. Um, it's life science enabled, wet lab enabled, um, and we're looking to put in about 170,000 square foot of wet lab enabled space in. Um, and you touched on before, you said there's about 100, currently about 100 square foot in London. Um, but of course, there's a lot more developments coming forward. Um, and the developments that you're seeing that have got planning permission or are seen to obtain planning permission. What's their sort of wet lab provision in the building? And um, sorry, yeah, Katie, it's probably one for you, or maybe Tom from Savills. But, and also, um, what is, how is that split throughout the building? Are they essentially trying to make all um, floors enabled or just three of the floors on a 10 story building, for example? Um, that's a very good question. And a question we get asked a lot. Um, I think no one's gonna give you the answer to that because that fundamentally comes down to the USP of that business. Um, you know, the way we build labs is our expertise and it's what makes us different. Um, so where we, where we see our competitors in the marketplace, they will never quite openly tell you. They'll tell you on a building by building basis if Tom's representing a, a tenant that's gonna come and take the space, then, then you'll get told. Um, I think it comes down to building specific are, are we retrofitting? Are we building new? Um, I think that's very much what you touched on. Um, it depends. It depends on the business, who's building it, what advice they're getting, what expertise they have themselves, and the location. Um, so that's not really answering your question, but it yeah. comes down to um, who it is that's building it fundamentally. I think this brings us back to the point that Georgia and I were making earlier. There isn't a standard brief. You know, it's, it's just project by project it seems to be doesn't it and as I say that's down to it could be area related you know what they're expecting their tenancies to look like and how they're banking on the future looking as well one more sorry one little more thing. what we've actually found recently is um part of how we do our splits in our building we've got a development we're looking at at the moment part of that's actually influenced uh, by our planning conditions um which i think is probably where you're conversation your questions come from um so yeah there's just a whole range of considerations i'm going to say one more question and then i'll allow drinks tom go on <laughs> he's meant to be answering them if you ask steve you. um it's, it's sort of two questions that are linked um so do you think there's any um sort of metric you can give around what the over cost is to for a landlord to enable a, um, uh, you know, what would be an office building? What's the overcost to get to a lab enabled building? And also, do you think there's any ability 
to start challenging some of the requirements that occupiers have around air changes or some of the other things that they have like so is six air changes absolutely what you have to have could you could it be four air changes you know are there any are there any things that might maybe you could move the dial a bit to actually help with cost and building adaptability. I'll do you do want to the, do the cost I'll one? Do the, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll do, I'll do Can the you? Cost and you do air changes. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so on the air change thing, I think, um, I think you're right. There are many things we can do. And I think that's what I was trying to, and probably badly explaining, is that I think we need to be careful about defining the provision we're going to make in a building so that we allow something that may be an office provision but can be upgraded to a lab provision maybe on a floor by floor basis maybe on a kind of like you know vertical slice basis or something else so that we don't over provide in the base case but that there's a way of augmenting it if necessary if a, if a life science tenant comes along so that's one thing the other thing I would just say about those air change rates is that Every single person you talk to has a different number in their head. And what I was saying earlier about the kind of research change and the cleanliness change and what people are actually doing means that the proportion of space on a, even in a wet lab, the proportion of space that's fume cupboards is going to vary drastically. So I think that finding an adaptable way that can then be tailored towards a tenant is the best way of answering that. You know, we can over provide, anyone can over provide, that's not clever. You know, certainly not these days, it's not clever. Um, and so we need to be, we, we almost need to define the limitation, the kind of upper cap, and then work out what that means in terms of differences of air changes in a, in a building and, and have an average. And I think that's probably the approach that most people are taking. So that's that bit. Right, I can't believe we're gonna finish on a cost question after I said we're not talking about cost tonight, but um, I'm also gonna be a classic QS and say massive range. Um, and it's hugely dependent on everything that we've spoken about tonight in terms of brief um, and what you're starting as your office um, product. Are we a steel frame to start with, a concrete frame to start with? So I would say broad brush, 30 to 60 pound a foot, just to enable, to so just to give yourself some flexibility and that really is to do with and that grows and shrinks on your floor to floor heights and how far you're taking your shell and core versus your fit out because there isn't kind of the defined provision as well as all of Anne's air and cooling and power um, and all of those things so I'd say it is really heavily dependent on setting that brief and just how far you're willing to take it how far along in the design process you are. And that would be it. And uh, it looks like Katie wants to say something as well. Yeah, just coming back to the, the tenant point and, you know, can we challenge this uh, air changes, et cetera, of course, um, everything that Anne's touched on. Um, I think it's ultimately it's who's providing the space um, and do they have the understanding and the technical understanding and the experience to challenge that. Something that I find so exciting about what we do at Kadans is that we have that in-house technical um, understanding and confidence um, that we know what we're delivering and we, we understand this product, um, but also our advisors that we work side by side with absolutely have that confidence that we can challenge the status quo. And actually, sometimes we found ourselves actually educating the tenant. They're saying we need X, Y, and Z. And we've actually said, no, if you think about A, B, and C, um, actually it'll work much better with what you're trying to do. Um, so I think it depends on who's delivering that, that lab space ultimately. Okay, um, thank you all very much. So I do just want to say a very final thank you to the four panellists for all their time and effort that they've put into um, preparing for this event and everything that you've done. Again, a big thank you to HTS for hosting us and sponsoring us tonight. And thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's greatly appreciated that we didn't deliver this to an empty room, uh, as well as to the people who managed to join us online. It seems like the technology has done what it's meant to do. So um, I will close and then I think there's some drinks that everyone can have. So please feel free to stay around and have a drink and discussion. Thank you very much.